my name is Paresh. I'm from Boston. Yes, there's only about five feet of snow on the ground here, but uh, it's nice and cozy. It's a very pleasant uh, zero degrees uh, Celsius here right now. So um, this is my contact details and LinkedIn. It's Paresh Motivala. Twitter is Paresh Motivala. Facebook is Paresh Motivala. Instagram is Paresh Motivala. Uh, Snapchat is something like that. But yes, I think you should be able to find me. Um, I'm on, I own the Boston BI chapter. I am on the leadership group for the DBA virtual user group, which is a worldwide user group. As you know, we used to have a counterpart for that in past, which had 40,000 members. Or, and then New England SQL Server user group, which is the oldest SQL Server user group in USA. So I'm also on the board for them. And me and my wife run this organization called Circles of Growth, where I teach and she teaches soft skills, public speaking, conversational languages, debating, uh, interviewing skills, actually, believe it or not. So anybody wants to go interviewing, let me know. Uh, we even have a lot of presentations for interviewing alone. So I have two presentations on that. So, okay. So what will we talk about today, right? I mean, what does maintenance plan actually consist of? So the maintenance plans are basically what? Backups, right? Uh, we have, we'll talk about staggered backups, we'll talk about striped backups, and we'll talk of parallel backups, and you can use that with PowerShell and such, right? And then we'll talk about restores, how restores help us, right? Same thing, striped restores, there's nothing like a staggered restores, because restores, most of the time we do on need basis only. Uh, snapshot replications, uh, not the type of replication that we know, but this is a different type of replication. A lot of you might have already heard of that. We will talk about it in significant detail, actually. And then natural corollary to snapshot replication is the copy data virtualization. So what is copy data virtualization? Uh, how it can save you literally millions of dollars and millions of dollars in terms of minutes. So this is a good software product to have. Um, how do you go about checking your database integrity, for example? I will talk about that also. Uh, this is something that I have worked very really hard on, and it has saved us a lot of time and money, actually. Um, the reindexing job that we run, hey, everybody runs reindexing, right? So reindexing, rebuilding, reorganizing the indexes, right? And then updating statistics. These are the three parts that we carry out at some regular and painful frequency, right? So we'll talk about that as well. Uh, and then timing your maintenance, right? So that is crucial for us too. So we'll talk about how to time your maintenance because the best time to run your backup is in the middle of the day when all the users are there. So they start complaining and you go ahead and save the day that is called job security. So yeah, timing your maintenance is an absolutely fabulous uh, thing that you want to keep in mind. Uh, this is one thing which is not spoken about too much at various uh, conferences that I have been to. That is the third party job schedulers. So I would strongly suggest please uh, look into it. Like one of my customers has 6,000 jobs on one SQL server and they are not even reporting subscriptions. So you know when you have a reporting subscription, you have that crazy 25,000 character long job name that automatically gets generated. These are not even that. These are actual jobs that run. Um, so every time we have a problem with the SQL Server or we build a new SQL Server, we have the painful responsibility of migrating these. So you might want to watch out for that as well. And there's one hidden benefit to this also, which I will share with you soon. And then planning for all of this and then reassessing. You should not sit on your laurels for a very long time is the bottom line. So every six months or a year, see if what you are doing is solving some problem for your customer, whether it's internal or external. If not, fine tune your maintenance plans, uh, change them, go for a newer technology. How do you go for a newer technology? Well, you are already in the right place. You are in a user group meeting, conferences, and a lot of blogs where you can actually read about the new technology. So reassess whatever you did, okay? And in the end, we will have some more room for questions and answers. <clears throat> so 
So let's start with our friends backups. So staggered backups, OK? So the way we do is. Uh, I don't know how best to explain this. Let me try this. So we can take some large databases. Not every one of them has to be backed on Sunday. So some large databases, depending on the size and their importance or whatever it is, you can actually run one on Monday, the other one on Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, or some can start at 8 p.m. So others can start at 10 p.m. So that is what staggering essentially means, right? And typically what we would do is uh, run a full backup weekly, uh, a differential daily, and transaction logs hourly or every 15 minutes. Now, just if there is a show of hands and if you guys, whoever is monitoring this can tell me. <clears throat> how many of you run like three full database backups every day? Ah, Rob is here too. Hey, hi Rob. <clears throat> so. We have had people who have had three full backups on a daily basis. That's very dangerous. Don't do that, please. Um, <clears throat> this is what I suggest. Follow this, you'll be happy. And then Stripe backups. So this is where I spent a lot of time uh, as a case study. So I have some of the findings here. A couple of them are missing now because it's been an old project, but we are consistently working on databases of sim sizes, so I will. I want to share this. So if nothing today, take this uh, set of slides and a slide on the copy data virtualization. These two will actually change your life. <clears throat> so this was a three terabyte database, right? And when you compress it, it became 280 gigs. The backup drives are of RAID 5, right? And this is the output that I wanted to share with you. So the dev server was four cores and eight gigabytes. So when we had an eight file backup, give me one sec, what can I throw this? Uh, Parash, then you're talking about Stripe backups. You're talking about backing up to multiple backup files, files. right? Multiple files, okay. yeah, that's what. So okay. eight files, four files, and so on. Now, when you do this experiment, right, uh, do you remember these are the options that are available to you. Max transfer size, uh, block size, buffer count. These all really are great. But when you are doing this backup or these types of backups, there's one person you do not want to forget. Any guesses who it can be? Anybody wants to give a response on the chat here? Number of cores. Uh, no, I'm saying somebody you should not forget, not something, somebody. He's saying a Who would person. You know? Yep. So you should take care of involving your storage person in this exercise, because look at this IO. 634, 650, 615. So if your SAN is also hosting another set of environments, which it is in all probability, then you are going to kill the other environments too. So when you are running these kind of backups, make sure that he or she is able to run a background check on how much of latency is there while you kick off the backup and how much duration each of these latency lasts. That is what will guide you to your safe, happy medium for your backup. And what are the most common types of backup weights you get? Backup buffer, async IO, and backup IO. So these three are there, so don't panic. You will get these. So this is the next set of machines, right? Let me show this. Again, four cores, eight GB, right? But we changed the parameters a little bit, and you can see the time has now come down to 72 minutes. CPU went up to 97% in this case when we took an eight file backup. Uh, so you might want to watch out for that. Um, 
how much it is and then take your happy medium out there. Uh, again, same thing, but one more here. This is the production server and you see with 16 rack cores and 64 gigabyte RAM, we were actually able to finish an eight file backup in 30 minutes. The same database, which was taking about two to two and a half hours or one, one and a half hour is now under 30 minutes. The recent most example that I'm working on with my customer was their seven terabyte database was taking eight hours for backup. And now it takes them one hour and four minutes or one hour and five minutes. So the ripple effects are pretty high, right? So now that extra time that you saved because of this, what would you do with that extra time? So you can use that for lowering your re-indexing threshold, for example, instead of 30% rebuild, now you can say if it is 20% or more, then rebuild, which means you are now able to actually have a better shot at your performance because more and more of your indexes are getting rebuilt. In this one, we found that um, the IO was 310. Uh, the buffer count we used was 800. Remember when you use the buffer count, the memory pressure on your SQL server will be extremely high. And the max transfer size, max it out, I don't care. Uh, it's pretty cool actually, you like it a lot. But from eight hours to one hour and four minutes, it's absolutely amazing result. And this is not just theory, this is actually something that has worked for us. Then, <clears throat> this coming back or what happened? Okay, so this is just a single file backup. It was taking four hours roughly and the CPU was pegged at 47. But now with two file backup, it was coming down and then coming down further and then coming down further. The idea was that when you are running the backup, there's not much going on on your uh, server. So you can afford to have a 70%, but remember it is now only lasting for two hours, not four hours. So everything is a happy medium here. So different types of servers, different types of storage. Before you incorporate or start using any backup or restore solution or maintenance plans, make sure that you practice before you. Uh, Parash, quick question. Yeah. Uh, would you recommend to uh, back up to uh, multiple files that the number is higher than the number of cores? Uh, I would. Let's say you have four cores, yeah, and correct. would you recommend to back up to eight files? No, I wouldn't, because if it is a four five four core machine, then chances are your database is not that big as database, anyways, right? But I do not have a 100% answer for you because I see where your question is coming from. I can get back to you on that. If you can just shoot that to me as a question uh, on the email, I will definitely promise I'll get back to you on that. Uh, okay. Sure. I mean, usually the practice is match the number of cores to number of backup files. Yes, but I have not attacked it from that angle, and that is why I'm saying that I am not Got prepared with that answer, that. right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Sure. So my thing was only here timing, use of CPU time or the CPU percentage and the uh, I O the MBPS is what I was worried about, right? So that was the angle. I never actually thought of what you said, and I need to worry about that too. So I will look into it myself. Okay, but thank you for bringing it up. I am not prepared, and I will get back to you on that. Sure, thank you. So parallel backups. Uh, the way you would do is can you run multiple SQL jobs at the same time. Uh, why not? Uh, try that if you can uh, without killing your, because chances are you are actually backing it up over network to a NAS somewhere, in which case your NIC can only handle so much. So you might want to try that one small chunks of backup at a time before you go crazy by running four parallel jobs, hoping that everything will work out fine. No, it may not, okay? so. Uh, <clears throat> is this portable? Portable means chances are that you have 
a cluster, uh, this fails over, one of the nodes has to be replaced. The new machine that you get may or may not be as powerful as the machine that is in place right now. Will this work on the other one? So when you change your machines or you are just copying this, say for example, today you are moving from server A to server B, your general tendency will be to run SPDEV login, copy all your logins and restore them onto the target server. You would do the same exact thing with the SQL backup jobs. Can the new server handle this is something you want to keep in mind or keep it in the back of your pocket when you are planning for your new server that yes, my old maintenance plan worked on the old server. Maybe the new server, I can have eight file backups as against the four file backups. So you might want to keep your op options open for that. <clears throat> and as I told you, talk to your storage guy or your infrastructure guy. The NIC is something which is really absolutely ridiculous. Uh, some of your best designs can be foiled because the NIC is not configured optimally. By the way, I have a question, and uh, this is not a joke. Usually you end up asking a joke half the time in the speeches, but um, we have a file table based database. So we have a file stream database. Uh, it used to run for about six hours and the backup for six terabytes. And that is about a year back. And since one year we have involved uh, Microsoft because now the backup takes about six to seven days. We have not been able to figure out why that is happening. So if anybody knows, uh, Anything about file stream backups, please do let me know. I would love to do this with you. Use DBA tools, uh, PowerShell, right? A lot of it, and you can see that there's a full article over here, how you can backup uh, databases in parallel using PowerShell. So it kind of spawns off like multiple threads that will run it in the background, right? So you don't have to be doing a lot of uh, manual configuration and so on. So, but remember, will your NIC and your target uh, NAS's MBPS or the storage capacity and the storage's latency, can that handle it is the question. So you might want to watch out for that too. <clears throat> this, by the way, is an excellent article. If you have not read it, I would strongly suggest please read this and this will be available for you to uh, peruse when you get a chance. So uh, this again, uh, let me see this type restores. We found that the eight file backup took about 109 minutes to restore, whereas the four file backup took only 96 minutes to restore the same file. Now this time we had gotten a little wiser. So we started to say latency one lasted there was 36 milliseconds and it lasted 10 seconds. Then the latency two was 23 milliseconds and it lasted 86 seconds. So we had our storage engineer uh, working with us hand in glove to make sure that we were not killing and we were actually. Uh, <clears throat> hey, thank you, Gary. Appreciate your help. Uh, we are actually have a case with Microsoft for the past six months and they are actually making me run a check disk on a five terabyte volume on SAM, which we abandoned today. Uh, so just so you know, so this is a Stripe restore. So just the Stripe backup finishing in 30 minutes is no good if the Stripe restore is taking you significantly longer. So do not treat your backup as just a backup in its own entity, but try to work keeping in mind how much it takes for you to restore it as well. Any questions, comments on this so far? OK. So this is the same database, by the way, so I didn't do that. And yes, in instant file initialization was enabled. So cool. This is the little fun part that I share with everyone. Jesus saves, right, and makes incremental backups. So. Uh, database integrity checks. What's the frequency? Um, anybody here would like to contribute? Can we make this a little more interactive than we have currently?
uh, I think what we have done is we running daily uh, physical only and running weekly uh, full check DB. OK, great. So pretty, pretty cool, right? That's the best thing to do, right? OK. So frequency, correct? Daily, weekly, what do you want to do? You decide based on your user requirements, right? You just can't do this all by yourself and you can't be a dictator and tell the customer, ha, huh, this is what I have because this is what I learned in precious class, right? No, you can't do that. Here's the one. This is going to be a fun question. Against which database would you run your database integrity check? All, maybe minus TemDB. No, sir. So say, for example, you have only one database on your server. OK, that database is called Steve DB. OK, like if they have Maria DB, why not a Steve DB, right? Why so not, sure. could they have a Steve DB. Yeah, exactly. So we have a Steve DB uh, on your production server. We already answered, OK, we are going to be doing the database integrity checks once a week, correct? Now are we going to run it against this database or something else? I'll tell you what I mean and then you can tell me. What I do is for some of the cases where we do not have time in production, we take a snapshot or a replication, not replication, sorry, a snapshot or a backup of this production database, restore it to the lower region so that they can eventually use it for reporting and run the DBCC against this reporting database. If there is a problem, then you run it against production. But what are the chances? What are the last time that your DBCC actually returned an error, right? Remember, this is not SQL 2005 anymore, right? We are now on SQL 2019. Um, I have yet to be let down by Microsoft after SQL 2014. Uh, that's pretty raw, then you'd be afraid to even put the next service pack in and all that, but now we don't care. I, I do that with a lot of confidence, so I'm not worried about that. So I take a copy of the backup, restore it on a lower region somewhere, and then go ahead and run your DBCC check. This is number two largest time saver for you. Okay, so try to do that. So what you're basically time. doing is you are offloading the check DBs to another server. Correct. So that's your maintenance okay. window is technically lower now, right? Yep. Good on Makes time. Sense? Okay. Yeah. Then let's talk about snapshot replication. Who uses snapshot replication here? Not like the transactional replication or snapshot replication. So this would be a disk snapshot based replication which is now becoming very, very rampant, right? Like ActiveHero, which has now become part of Google. I worked in ActiveHero for a while, Cohesity, Delphix, uh, Rubrik. Yeah, that's the other company. So there are so many of them. They offer you snapshot replication. And uh, do you want a primer on snapshot replication, guys? Or you know about it? If even one person doesn't know, it might be worth uh, putting pressure on your bosses to get this damn thing in your organization as soon as possible because <clears throat> it takes only less than five minutes to back up your entire database no matter what size it is. OK, uh, you can do it user based. I mean, daily you can do it every five minutes. You can do every one hour, whatever is the acceptable frequency for your customer. You can take a snapshot replication. What are the uh, oh man fresh? So we had a. We had a 100 terabyte database. Uh, 120 terabyte database, which the customer had never actually backed up. Please repeat after me. They had not backed up their database in six years. All they would do is, OK, you are working on this table. Let's back up that table. But other than that, they would not be able to back up anything till they went ahead and participated in this kind of technology. Uh, the initial ingestion took us. They gave us about one month to back up the database. We finished it in 50 hours. 
120 terabyte database. Now every week they are taking a full backup, which takes five minutes. 120 terabyte database backed up in five minutes, maybe 10, right? But the only problem with that one was that we had to depend on the infrastructure guy. And you know, the jokes between developer and the DBA, uh, the storage guy and the DBA, they are all true actually, they're not jokes. There are some serious issues there, right? So to be able to get that thing done uh, as quickly as you would like to, it's not possible. But as a concept, it is really awesome and it works. It works forever and forever. OK, I have used it for such a long time now that I cannot even. Remember how far back I did that. Uh, so now let's talk about restores on the snapshot replication. So if a 120 terabyte database is taking you, say, 10 minutes for backup, how much time do you think will it take for you to restore that database? And now please look at my hands. Restore. OK, how much do you think it would take? 50 hours, six months, 10 minutes. Somebody? OK, same I think time. some of you have, yeah, same time, really. So you see the difference is now that you don't have to, but you have to depend on the infra team. But the advantage now is that almost all your development people can have the same footprint of the database. It's not that QA1 has one week old database, QA2 has two week old database, QA3 has a database that was not refreshed in six months, right? Because now this is just a snapshot of the hard drive. It is so easier to replicate it and people don't have to worry about it. So uh, you have to unfortunately depend on the infra team so be nice to them, buy them beer. Steve was supposed to get me one soon. And the biggest question when we ask about a restore is, where do I restore it to? That is no longer valid because of the snapshot replication technology. You can go ahead and attach the snapshot of your storage to any server and believe it or not, you can actually even attach it to your own laptop. Just so you know, so you have a five terabyte database that works off your laptop, which has 500 gigabytes of. Hard drive. Um, it sounds. Like utopia or minority report, but it is not. I'm using it on virtually daily basis, so, so you know. Um, so then. After we are done with this, right? <coughs> Copy data virtualization. So this is one of the technologies that was built on top of the snapshot replication. And that has now taken off at this is about seven years ago. It had taken off about $75 billion out of the storage industry. $75 billion. OK, so how does copy data virtualization work? So let's look at that. OK, so we have one. Full database ingestion, so what it will do is it will go through your entire storage pertaining to that particular database or a set of database and map the entire storage and take it as one full backup. That takes time. But the good news is. All other full backups. Or transaction log backups. Are incrementals only there is nothing like a differential backup for them because you don't need it. Because you have a full backup of a 25 terabyte database happening every day and it takes you less than 30 seconds literally. So go figure. Why would you take a differential backup? Correct. Uh, you still do take transaction log backups just in case of corruption and such. And uh, these kind of softwares also give you the ability to back up transaction logs. So I forgot the name of the exe file, which is uh, kind of married with this. I don't know, maybe uh, was the Gary, right? Gary, uh, do you remember the uh, MS? Uh, 
msdb write or some some such file would actually go ahead and when it runs a transaction log using this technology it would actually write to your msdb backup history table i forgot the name of that right now but i i can try to find it for you later so remember that so every backup after the initial backup is incremental only you don't have to worry about full backups anymore okay um here's a beautiful part of it restore remember i already told you you don't have to worry about which server or which machine do these restores go to but the question is and i must tell you this again say for example we have rob here and we have elena so elena is the dba and rob is the developer and you know how they are developers uh, friday 4 59 pm he's going to come and tell elena elena i want a copy of that five terabyte database can you go ahead and kick off the restore so elena is a good dba she is very conscientious so she said says you know what rob i have to go home and uh, start getting drunk uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to kick off the restore i'll go home maybe in about three or four hours i'll go ahead and get it done for you so Rob says, OK, whatever. He goes home. Elena reaches home eventually by 11.30 or 12. Um, she got the restore done. She sends out a good news to Rob. Five minutes later, Rob sends her an email back. Oh, shit, I screwed up. I had a bad script. I need that restore again. And now think what Elena is going to do. So that is the biggest advantage of having this. Oh, we wait rob you want to restore give me two more minutes i'll give you one more database but the advantage of this one is that once you take a copy of this backup you can give 10 copies simultaneously and the biggest advantage of that is that you don't have to actually provide extra storage this is just the virtual copy of your database if you find it very difficult to visualize what i'm saying uh, Compare it to like a streaming service like a Netflix. So Netflix as a movie it doesn't really reside on your laptop. You're just looking at it as it comes. You don't really have any control on that, right? Of course, there is a way in which you can download a Netflix movie, but you don't do that 99.9% .9 of the time unless you're flying. So you can actually have 10, 15 copies of these given to 10 different sets of people at the same time. Oh, guess what? In five minutes. So this is something Yes, it comes at a cost and we can talk of that offline, but please do remember, yes, you can do that. So, so the which server, we don't have to worry about it anymore, right? But here, have you heard me saying the word your infrastructure guy at all? No, because this is something that a user can do it himself. So the most of these copy data programs are security driven user roles driven so you can actually say okay you know what gary is going to be the admin of this application steve is going to be user one uh, he can only have restore power on this set of databases whereas elena can have restore power for the entire vm and rob can have restore authority for the entire virtual like an availability group. So, you know, as we have in SQL Server now, we have a full blown AG and all that. These software also give you the ability to restore your AGs. So you can mark five databases as one set of AG. And then when you restore, you can restore all, all the five at the exact point in time to the target server. So that's the advantage there for you too. So it's user driven. Remember, uh, yes, it costs money. It's not free, but remember the amount of time you save. Uh, A, for backup and for restore. B, how many times have you had to roll back your script in production release because the database version that you tried on did not have the correct data for you? And that happens too frequently, right? So that is also loss of time, loss of business opportunity, and all that adds up. So remember, copy data virtualization is something you want to take home with you. Uh, there are two types of copy data virtualizations that are available there. One is uh, hardware 
based and the second one is software based. Software based runs slightly slower, but it is cheap and yes, you can use it very easily. You and I can install it in literally 10 minutes and you can do whatever you want to do with it. So. OK, let's talk about timing, right? So staggered reindexing number one. Uh, this is what I have done now, right? Um, I actually also strangely added this just last week. I was uh, surfing through YouTube and I ran into Brent Ozar's video. He said that, you know, most of the times the chances are it is the same freaking indexes that get uh, fragmented, right? So in Ola Hallengren script, for example, right? You see there is a portion of the script which says it goes to the databases and it picks up databases that are, I mean, the indexes that are 30 percent or more fragmented. Now, even running that script takes a long time. So what do you do? You run this on your target database, like a lower region where you restore the database, see which indexes on a weekly basis are getting fragmented, make a table of those on a regular basis. So in production, when you run the defrag job, you don't run that phase, but you say, OK, go to this table, pick up these indexes and just rebuild those indexes. That's all you have to do. So again, uh, if your reindexing job is lasting 12 hours, where you are asking the question, please rebuild it if it is 30% or more fragmented, but that query will run for two to three hours or at least two hours for you to get the results. OK, so just keep that in mind. You can run that query and save the results in a table. And then just run the rebuild part as against finding out which ones are fragmented. OK, so <clears throat> let's continue. Right, so we do this stuff, right? Stagger over days. When do we want to do that? We Weekends, if it is 30 percent or less, then reorgate, right? Stagger over the days, weekends, whatever. So these are the standard things that we do, anyways, right? But the most important thing that I brought to your attention was making a note of which are the most regularly offending indexes, and running that on a database that has been restored, where you are already running your check DB. That's the same place where you want to find out which indexes are fragmented. Okay. Rebuilding statistics. How many of you rebuild the statistics after rebuilding your indexes? Haha, <laughs> I used to do that, so fire me. Right? Uh, it's avoidable. Don't do that. Uh, don't shrink your databases. Please repeat after me. I will not shrink my database. Everybody happy? I'm actually doing it though, so don't tell anybody else. But that is for a different reason for. Very, very different reason. Uh, but yes, I am actually shrinking, but not as a part of the maintenance. This is a different project altogether. <clears throat> I think one of the good reasons to shrink a database is going to be high number of VLA files, right? Yes, that is, yes. So that is one. But what we are doing is that we have one database that was built like 12 years ago with one of my customers, and that is like one monolithic file of four and a half terabytes and two terabytes of logs, right? So that's very highly OLTP kind of data. Um, but the database after I compressed the table was um, it's performing good, but now there is about two and a half to three terabytes worth of empty space within that large monolithic file. What I'm suggesting to them is to not have one monolithic file, but have three more files or four files or whatever you decide so that the writing to the database can be striped as well as reading and that will actually further improve their performance. So what I'm trying to do is shrink the file as much as I can so that we can create three more files of equal size. So that way when the database is writing round robin, you know, it will grow proportionately. That is the general idea. So mm, got it. if I'm wrong, yeah, yeah please feel to uh, kill me on that one. <clears throat> make sure that you mark the instant file initialization properties uh, for yourself and for that service account. 
And most importantly, right? Clean up after yourself. Make sure that your database backups are cleaned up, whatever user defined frequency and whatever your service level agreements are telling you to do. That's very crucial for you, right? And this is good. Uh, the SQL 2016, whatever the maintenance plan announcements are there. SQL Shack has a very good article if you would like to go ahead and check it out. Uh, you want me to copy this for you here? The chat room for those, but you'll be giving this to them, right? Uh, the uh, PowerPoint, Steve? Yep. OK. So third party job schedulers, correct? For example, we I have experience using a software called Tidal. Anybody here uses third party job schedulers? A, nay, you can just type one word in the chat room. That's fine if you are too shy to speak up. By the way, I run public speaking classes too, so. OK, Gary is there. Hi, Gary, my good friend. Cool. So <clears throat> I use that a lot actually with some of the customers who actually listen to us, which is kind of cool. Uh, you don't require programming skills for them. OK. It has much better flow and error handling. It is so easy that even a DBA can use it. OK, no kidding. And the bigger advantage is that it can interact with everything. So these job scheduler can not only work with your S SQL server, they can work with your integration services, they can run with your Windows application server, uh, it can run with your Oracle server, everything under one roof. But wait, there's more. If your SQL server dies, you don't have to worry because the job is actually scheduled through the main server here. So all you have to do is just start up your SQL server elsewhere, change the name over here, ta-da, everything else will work just like the way it is. So it is so much faster to be able to recover from that. Um, it really helps a lot, uh, saves a lot of time and money. And guess what? Uh, all the DBAs, now you're going to open up your ears to me when I make this statement. The thing is that most of the time, the third party job schedulers are not monitored by DBAs, ta -da, which means somebody else is having their midnight oil. And that means that you can actually have a decent sleep for a change, right? And if there's something wrong, you would have noticed that most of the on call things that you get is things which are fairly simple. So out of the 100 calls that you receive in a year, if 60 of them can be solved by a tech support person because they know and it is that tech person, tech support person who is running this third party job scheduler who can already attend that for you without having to wake you up. So that's kind of awesome. So remember, the logging is also pretty extensive. OK, so. From what we did in Tidal that for a SQL job, we would actually have the luxury um, of going ahead and logging the simultaneous event logs also. So you don't have to go about uh, looking into two or three different places to find what the heck happened to my job. And Steve says Jams is a good software too, right? Arun says the same thing. OK, Arun, thank you, my friend. Uh, I like interactivity a lot because believe it or not, it's 11 p.m. here in Boston. I should be sleeping. <laughs> cool. Um, and it eliminates, guess what? Human errors, right? See, oh my God, there's some errors here. But yeah, this can be avoided if you use third party uh, job schedulers, correct? I wish Microsoft actually comes up with something like this. It uh, helps you automate the heck out of your systems, right? And literally, unless you are doing something really concrete, you don't even have to log on to the SQL Server much because of these. So third party job schedulers, absolutely fabulous, right? Maybe you like this. Check it out. I'll give you 30 seconds to read it. Seven fifty one days ago. Remember, I told you they had not backed up their databases in six years. Something similar, but seven fifty 
51 days is just about two years. So, yeah, awesome. Okay, so planning and reassessing, right? Very crucial. So look for what? Changes in the environment, very important, right? Um, when you do this, there's one thing also changes with that, and that is your business requirements, because chances are your business paradigm has changed, your business ownership has changed, either you have been purchased or somebody you are purchasing, a lot changes, so you have to constantly innovate yourself, right? So, and why would that stop with your database maintenance programs, right? Uh, look for newer technologies. Like when I heard of the copy data virtualization technologies in 2014, when I joined Actifio, I was like, what? 120 terabyte database restored in 10 minutes? I have never seen that. I mean, it's usually hours for us for even two terabyte database. So uh, keep on going to use a group like this. Uh, LA, awesome. I need to be there one day. Uh, but more importantly, in the newer technologies, is look at how it affects downstream and upstream. So when you have a new technologies, A, how will the customer use it downstream, correct? But because of this technology, can I change some dirty things that I used to do prior to this technology came into picture, right? Which means that you have to reinvent yourself. That is the bottom line here. So newer technologies can save your life. Actually, I have a 75 minute presentation on a topic called why are DBAs shy of using tools? If you ask a DBA, oh yeah, I write my own scripts. I mean, seriously, dude, when there's DBA tools, why the hell would you want to write your own scripts, right? So yes, but there are people who do that, correct? Okay. <clears throat> Just so you know, this is also what something you see a lot of times, right? OK. So what did we speak about today? Right? In good time. So we spoke about backups. We spoke, uh, spoke about staggered backups, right? We spoke about Stripe backups. We spoke about parallel backups with PowerShell. We spoke about restores and how we go about doing Stripe restores, right? And sometimes parallel restores, but very rarely so. Uh, snapshot replications, um, something I'm sure a lot of you are already doing it, but you're possibly not aware, or maybe your infrastructure guy is a bigger jerk than you think he or she is, and that is why they did not share these possibilities with you. But today, for example, I had to uh, restore a five terabyte database, and literally in five minutes, we were there. In five minutes, the customer had a five terabyte database, right? And literally all I had to do was send an email to the infrastructure guy saying that, okay, I have detached this particular database. That database was on drive letters JKL. Please go ahead and refresh the drives JKL. So what he will do, he will go to the production server, take a snapshot of the production server the way it exists, and present it to this server as drive JKL. Guess what? Five minutes later, you have a brand new database. And of course, then you have to do some massaging like user scripts that user permissions have to be removed, added, whatever, uh, convert the database from full restore to simple restore. But these are all C category items, right? These don't take more than five minutes to run anyway. So, and guess what? If you screwed up, five more minutes later, you have another database ready to go. <clears throat> We also spoke about copy data virtualization, that how it is a natural extension of snapshot replications and how quickly they can be proliferating. Uh, also, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you about copy data virtualization and shame on me for not doing this earlier, but if you are storing your backups for a period of five years and now with the GDPR and all the data privacy and all that crap that is going on in the world, one terabyte database over a five year period amounts to approximately two petabytes of storage. How much? Two petabytes or petabytes or whatever you want to call it, right? 
that is how it translates. So whereas with copy data virtualization, haha, your two terabyte database will possibly grow to three terabytes in two years or five years, it'll go to double the size. So maybe you're talking of 10 terabytes, but definitely not two petabytes of storage. OK, and the same thing with your uh, multiple environments that require you to uh, restore these databases for yourself, right? OK, check your database integrity on the databases that you restore using snapshot replication or copy data virtualization. Check it out there. That's really awesome. Uh, Re-indexing jobs. Uh, remember, if you are already restoring it and you are running check DB on that particular target database, then run your re-indexing discovery script on that target database and then rerun it and then run it on your production database. Is somebody's computer making too much noise or it's just me? Let me see who is not muted. OK, so that was I know who it was. OK, cool. So reindexing versus rebuilding, right? Reorganizing and updating statistics. You want to take care of that. Time your maintenance to make sure that your customers are not unhappy, especially the people in HR or finance, because these are the guys who actually write your checks. So make sure that they are always happy. So time your maintenance. If the maintenance window is up to eight o'clock, make sure it is finished by 7.50 or 7.55, okay? Uh, third party job schedulers, if you get your hands on them, it's definitely a good practice to have. Uh, not yet very popular, but I would say, please give it a shot, okay? Um, now the Planning and reassessment. Remember, I told you keep on reassessing because the business would have changed, the business needs would have changed, you would have changed, technology would have changed, and so on. So, obviously, the next one would be question and answers. Anybody have questions, answers, comments, or I mean, if you have questions, I'll try to get the answer. I have one question that you have to send me, Steve. I will. Owe, I owe you that answer for that. Okay. But um, anybody have questions, comments, have questions, observations? Comments, observations? Yes, Gary. Yeah. Hey, uh, Paresh, did you say it's a no-no to rebuild statistics following the re-indexing stuff? So if you have rebuilt the index, yes. If you have read the question is, uh, would you update the statistics after rebuilding the index? In fact, if you remember, I told you we need to remove that from the job that we were working on, Gary, the, for that very reason. So if you're already Correct. rebuilding okay. the index, yeah, the statistics are already reset. And I used to make that mistake before, so if that okay. answers the question. Okay. Anybody else have observations? Anything that I can do to make this a better presentation? I um, feel free to connect. I have my uh, slide here again. Uh, I don't want to let you go without another set of jokes, and then I'll share my contact information again just in case you guys want to reach out to me bouquets brick bats anything if you like me to come again and talk about some of the other things uh some of the other topics that i have spoken about is you know the microsoft's data modernization tour so i was actually trained by pam lahood by the way uh, if you'd know gary so Pam LaHood actually, she trained me on that data migration tour and we conducted four sessions here in the New England area for Microsoft, just kind of awesome. So that is a super presentation also, and that in conjunction with uh, from DBA to project manager in 60 minutes flat, I think, so if you're ever planning to upgrade, migrate, your servers, these two presentations married with each other would actually make you the star of your organization. I absolutely promise. So if you need to see that, share it with Steve. I will see whenever is the next uh, speaking opportunity. I will definitely speak about that too, right? Uh, and these are my contact information for those who like to connect. 
Uh, if you are going to connect on LinkedIn, please do let me know where you heard me or where we met. Otherwise, I will not connect. Uh, Twitter, yes. Uh, hey, I have 1,100 followers now, which is kind of cool. And uh, thank you very much for having me. I am absolutely on time. I had prepared for this for one hour. So Steve, Elena, uh, thank you guys for watching out. And uh, Timanta for watching the live stream. I hope uh, everybody had a good shot at this. Yep, Parash, thank you. That was a great presentation. Yeah, thank cool. you very much. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you.